the two sort of fairly minor notes, if you just freeze at the beginning of the shot. So with restoring 100 year old footage, you first of all have to look at it very closely and analyse what all the problems are. And the majority of the problems are actually caused by age. You know, what's happened in the last 100 years that either the film has been scratched at some point, it's been duplicated often, so the original film obviously being shot by the cameraman on the western front was pristine, but what is sometimes held in the archives is actually a third generation, fourth generation dupe. You've then got the fact that over a hundred years this film was shrunken, and so the sprocket holes where the film goes through the projector are now warped, which gives the film this sort of juddery, jumping up and down kind of feeling when you see it, so that had to be fixed. Again, with the duplication that's happened, it's lost sharpness, and so that has to be rectified. And then the speed, obviously, is one of the key things too, that the film in the First World War was shot by a cameraman who was winding the handle of a camera. Um, by hand and I've always thought that 16 frames a second was the speed of silent film you know and today obviously we use 24 frames and so we had to convert this film to 24 frames a second but when we actually looked at the 100 hours of film that we had we realized that the speeds were all over the place basically there was everything from 10 frames a second 12 often 13 14 was quite common 15, 16, less so, and then occasionally you'd get a 17 frames a second or 18 frames a second. And we had to know what these speeds were without any paperwork or any reference. What we would end up doing is basically taking a wild guess. And, and the wild guesses became less and less because we became quite good at being able to estimate what the original speed was. But it didn't really matter because if we got it wrong and we looked at the 24 frame a second version and it was too slow or too fast, you can immediately tell, even if it was one frame out, you can just tell it's not quite right. And so we would then just do it again and adjust it and you know, get it bang on. Because certainly when you get that speed spot on, it just suddenly comes to life. And all the artifice and the sort of artificial nature of it goes away and it suddenly becomes a real living piece of film. Generally the cameraman in the First World War shot reasonably static shots. Sometimes there's pans and tilts, but they are generally quite wide. It was just the style of shooting in those days. And that's how we're used to seeing this film. But because our restoration was able to get this footage so sharp, it actually enabled us to, you know, at times to zoom in to the original image, which I like because by doing that, we were producing shots that were a little bit closer, more to do with the way that we would shoot a film now. And because we were zoomed in occasionally too, we were able to do little tilts or pans to create a little bit of camera movement where the original footage is just a static frame, but we were able to just move a little bit within that and follow whatever the action was that was happening. And I really liked it because it sort of suddenly it felt like it wasn't First World War footage anymore. It gave it a slightly contemporary feel, even just those small little camera movements. Going through all the footage that we had access to in the archives, 100 hours, you know, it's amazing how the camera is such a distraction to what's going on. They're, they're not really able to focus on what they're supposed to be doing because there's a guy there with a movie camera filming them. Now, they've all probably been to the movies at this point in time, 1914, 15, 16, there was certainly a lot of cinemas around, but they probably would have never seen a movie camera. And so when they've got this guy there filming them, half of the soldiers are just sort of staring in sort of slight wonderment and in awe at this device that's actually filming them and the other half are sort of awkwardly standing there not quite knowing what to do because still photography in those days that the soldiers had all experienced you had to sit in a studio and stay still for 10 seconds you know be exposed to shutter and, and now they've got a, a guy filming them in the movie camera they've never been filmed before and then you can almost at times hear the cameraman saying move 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 walk about and suddenly they're having to move around and it's incredibly quite and naive to see people from 100 years ago sort of dealing with the concept of actually being filmed by a movie camera for the very first time some of the film that the imperial war museum have in the archives is, is almost black i mean it's so dark you can barely see what's actually on it and that's the way it's been for decades and it's interesting because a lot of that film is the stuff that has never really been seen because if you're a television producer sitting in the Imperial War Museum going through the footage, you 
are going to skip past all the dark stuff because you just assume that it's unusable or in some cases it's very brightly overexposed so it's kind of almost white and you're going to skip past that so we were really interested in those particular sections of film and we were able to get the image looking pretty great we were able to take the dark stuff and pull the original image out from the black and getting it looking pretty good and the bright stuff we were able to print it right down and get that looking good too so that in a way was one of the easier things that we did because it's something that was a regular film technique and that yielded some amazing results. So the one thing that you know jumps out once you restore this is that the faces and the people just come alive and I can feel who these individuals were, you can feel their personalities and you can see the fear, you can see the humour, you can see the tension. They're all people that we know and you realise that 100 years ago is not actually that long and we're you know, really looking at our grandparents or our great-grandparents. So it became apparent that that should be their story. So we then decided that the only voices that you would hear would be veterans that were actually in the war. There'd be no historians or presenters, it would just be a story that was told by the people who were there, in some respects the people that we're seeing on the film. We simply let the soldiers themselves tell us what this film should be. But it wasn't an idea that was there right from the beginning, it was something that organically came about as we went through each of these stages with the original footage. And we were lucky because the Imperial War Museum and the BBC had vast amounts of interview material that they had done in the 1960s and 70s with veterans of the First World War Mr. Barnes, 237, take one. I woke to the sound of heavy gunfire. As we could always tell mortar fire from ordinary shell fire. One had nothing to do but to sit in the mud shivering. The, the audio then was a case of getting as much as we possibly could because, you know, the same with the footage really, you want to just have the, the maximum amount of it before you even start to cut the film together. And Jabez Olsen and I really, the, the first thing we did which was, I say the first thing we did, it was about the first year on the project, was we had to look at 100 hours of footage, we had to listen to like 600 hours of audio recordings, because you can't even start the assembly and the construction of the movie until you've heard what you have available. And so we eventually narrowed it down, the 100 hours of footage came down to like six or seven hours, and the 600 hours of audio interviews probably came down to 30 or 40 hours. <laughs> we still had a lot of material. It's not, it's not too bad, it's not too bad. So there was a process then of what's this film about and you know exactly what angle are we going to take in and I didn't want to do anything that was imposing my point of view. The most interesting aspects of the, of the interviews with the veterans having listened to it all turned out to be not the big strategic things that they were talking about. The most interesting stuff was their sort of what you would call their mundane daily lives you know what they ate, how they slept, what they thought about shell fire, what they thought about the people that they were in the trench with, what the basic daily routine was. And so we really just made it as simple as we could, which is what, like what's an average British soldier, what was their experience serving on the Western Front. And when you listen to the audio, say for instance, the battle sequence, which all the, the accounts of the, of the fighting that we were hearing were all over the Western Front in that four year period. But nonetheless, you know, we realized that being under shell fire in 1914 was not a lot different from being under shell fire in 1917 or 18. So we listened to everything and we cut together what we felt was an accurate, generic experience of First World War combat. So we had this incredible audio track, which we assembled of you know 30 or 40 soldiers just describing what it was like to be in combat walking over the dead bodies of our coppers the dead would lie in all out i must have been frank but i think i was more numb but there's certainly elements of the experience on the western front that were not filmed key parts and especially combat we found a few examples of real combat and we put them in the movie like the trench raid that we had for example is definitely authentic but the one area of combat that we didn't really have any footage on is the intense attack. You know, they're, they're carrying the shell holes, they get up, they go in, you know, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Obviously no cameraman filmed that, it was just too dangerous. So that was a problem for us, so we had to start to get kind of inventive. In a way, I think that forced us to do some interesting things. I mean, the first thing we thought of doing was to juxtapose the faces of these soldiers many shots which we'd already actually seen earlier. So you're almost feeling like you're seeing an old friend again, you know, someone that you're familiar with. We zoomed in a little bit and we would actually render them out in slow motion. In the dialogue, we'll be talking about somebody getting killed and we do a, a smash, you know, shot cut to a body on the ground. So you're sort of saying, well, this person was alive one minute and he's dead the next. So we thought that was quite effective. 
But we couldn't do that the whole time, and so we still had these gaps to fill, and we didn't really know what to do. But then I remembered that I had a magazine called The War Illustrated. The War Illustrated was a weekly magazine that came out for the entire duration of the First World War. It was designed really so that people back home in England could each week they could look at the photographs of different parts of the various campaigns or the battles that were happening at that particular time. But of course they had the same problem as we had. They couldn't have their photographers in actual combat. And so what the War Illustrated resorted to was to hire a group of artists who would sketch the combat and they would provide pencil sketches of what they thought the uh, combat would have looked like. And so we thought, well, that's a possible way to go because at least it's contemporary to the First World War. It's not like a modern day comic or storyboard, it's something that was actually created during the war itself. And so I thought that I had a few of these magazines that I'd got at some point in the past and I thought maybe I had sort of 10 or 20 of them. But digging into my, um, my, my boxes of stuff that I've got, we I discovered to my delight that I had virtually an entire set. I, I had about two or three hundred of these magazines. So we were able to sit in the cutting room and as Jabez was assembling the battle scene, I'd be marking up pictures and handing them over to him. And then Jabez was able to take the pictures that would match the audio the best and sort of basically treat it almost like a storyboard that you would do for a movie. And the only thing that we felt a bit uncomfortable about, but we couldn't do much about it, is the war illustrators are very much a propaganda magazine showing the British being heroic and the Germans being sort of snivelling cowards virtually. You know, that's the way that that's presented in these wartime magazines. We tried to avoid the worst of that type of drawing. So having decided that the movie would be the restored black and white footage and the narration would be the veterans, it did seem that we should colourise this footage. The reason being is that it just became their story of what they experienced and everything that they're talking about and describing in their narration, they're seeing that in colour because they lived their experiences in colour. So to me it was a no-brainer really that we had to go down the road of colourising this footage and I don't have a problem with that. I mean I have issues with colourising black and white films where the director of the film has chosen to make the film in black and white for artistic reasons but in my mind there was only black and white film available to these cameramen on the Western Front. And I think that if in 1915 or 16, you went up to one of those cameramen and said, you can either use color or black and white, which would you like? Every one, every one of them would have grabbed the color film. I mean, wh why would you not? So to me, there was no moral issues with actually doing the colorization. Obviously it has technical issues that we had to deal with because colorization has been seen quite a lot. And in fact, first world war footage has been colorized in the past, but it's been done for TV shows, done very quickly. And the one thing with colorization that I came to realize is the longer that you spend on a shot, the better it's gonna be. So again, like the restoration of the black and white, I was thinking, how good can we make the colorization if we're actually able to spend a bit of time on it? And we used an American company called Stereo D to do our colorization. They were great to work with, they were incredibly enthusiastic and came down to New Zealand a lot to basically learn about the colours of the First World War because there's the technical aspects of, you know, just simply turning a black and white film into colour, which is, you just have to cut it around the various shapes, frame by frame, and that's the uniform. But then on, in, within that uniform, you've got badges, buttons, various things that are also different colours. And the more amount of layers of this detail that you can add to the colour, the better it gets, so the more time spent, the better. But nonetheless, Stereo D had to have a crash course in history of the British Army and the German Army. So fortunately, down here in New Zealand, I've got a fairly large collection of original uniforms and equipment from the war. So Stereo D would often come down, base themselves here, and we'd get out some of the uniforms that I had. And so, you know, they would be colourising with the uniform actually there in the room. Cockades on there. Have, have you guys had a look at, look at the colour of the um, of these cockades on the, the helmets on, 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 the, on these caps? Well, we've got one down the hallway. We should just check and see. Because the colours of the uniforms of the First World War, even though it's the army and everything is sort of pretty much the same, you'd think the colourisation would be sort of simple. But unfortunately, the British uniforms being khaki and the German uniforms being field grey, both of those colours are very weird strange colours. They're amalgams of different colours, like khaki is yellow, brown, green, in different amounts. And it was a struggle at times to actually get the khaki the right colour or the field grey the right colour. It was a lot harder than, than I thought it would be, but um, you know, it had to be right because when it was wrong, it was wrong. The thing with the colourisation that surprised me the most 
is that the absolute hardest thing to colorize, I would say, was the grass. Grass and the dirt, it was the actual environment. And you think grass is green. Well, it's multitude of different shades of green. And if you get it wrong, it's, it's wrong, because whereas you've got a little bit of leeway with a German tunic color or a British helmet color, in terms of what audiences uh, might think, everybody knows what grass is like. So we realize that with the, the environment, there isn't anywhere near the latitude that there was with the uniforms. So I really wanted to get the landscapes right because when you travel to those places, the landscapes are different to what they are in New Zealand or America. So what I did about a year, year and a half ago, was I took myself off to Belgium and France for two or three days, just completely alone. I hired a car, I had a camera, and I just drove around Flanders to where all the different battle locations were. And I just would simply take as many photos as I could possibly do over two or three days. I took thousands. And occasionally I was able to photograph the, the actual locations that some of the shots were filmed in. There's a sequence in the movie, there's two or three shots of the Lancashire Fusiliers huddled in a sunken road, a farm trap, and they were waiting to climb up the bank and attack the German trenches, which were about a hundred yards away. And some looked utterly, utterly terrified, quite understandably so. And so I was able to go to the sunken lane and that's identical now as it was then, a hundred years has gone by and it has not altered one bit. So I was able to photograph the sunken lane angles matching what was shot a hundred years earlier and that was the basis of the colorization for the environment that we did. And most of the guys that you see in that film uh, were probably killed. Most of those guys were in the last 30 minutes of their life when that film was shot. As well as having the, the veterans um, telling us their stories on the soundtrack, we also wanted to put sound with the actual footage itself to produce a realistic sounding soundtrack for the pictures you're seeing. So our sound department went to work doing that and that involved many different aspects. They had to do foley, which is providing footsteps in the mud, shovels in the ground, working the rifles, everything that they see in a particular shot, every tiny nuance that would possibly make a sound they have to actually produce the sound. Fortunately, with things like the artillery, um, I've got a few bits of First World War artillery, as you do. So we were able to wheel out some of my 18 pounders and six inch howitzers, and they did a recording session of recording the sound of the breech blocks opening and the shells going in. And, you know, and so all of that sound that you hear in the movie is the authentic sort of sound. One of the key things about the First World War is it was basically a war of artillery. I mean, the, the infantry's experience of the First World War was really being shelled, your guns shelling the Germans. Artillery was a dominant factor in the First World War, and we didn't want to go to a sound effects library and get bangs and wishes from, you know, generic sort of sound effects. So the New Zealand Army do um, live firing training several times a year, and they invited us to come up. And they were using 105 inch howitzers, which are, you know, a caliber very similar to, to the guns that we're seeing on film. And so we sent our sound team up and they had microphones planted all around the ground where the shells actually hit. They also put microphones up on the top of the ridge. So as these shells come screeching over that whistling sound that you hear in, in the movie, that is the sound of real shells flying a few feet just above. So, you know, we, we, the artillery sounds to me were very important because that is a very dominant sound that these soldiers experience. The other aspect of the soundtrack that we had to do was every time a soldier looks like they're talking, we had to hear their voices. And what we were able to do is to go to some professional lip readers, some forensic lip readers. They were able to tell us what the soldiers were actually saying on screen because all you'd see are there silent film of them talking. Come on, get in. They're taking our phone. Oh, good. Get in. And the